Welcome to TPGI's Real People, Real Stories podcast, where you'll find interesting and diverse stories from folks working to make the world a more inclusive place. Hey, welcome to Real People, Real Stories podcast brought to you by TPGI. I'm your host, Mark Miller, thanking you for helping us keep it accessible. Do us a favor. If you're enjoying the Real People, Real Stories podcast, share it. Tell someone about it. Hey, even link to it from your accessible website. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. I want to introduce to you um, sort of an old friend of mine, Dustin Gianelli. Um, Dustin, you and I met a couple years ago when you were at CSUN working with Replay. Um, we had a great, great conversation, got to know each other a little bit there, and, and here we are. We're here again. Um, and since then, you've made a lot of changes in your life. You're doing keynote speaking. And you're all you also have a, a bunch of brand partnerships. So the first thing I want to find out from you, I get keynote speaking. It makes sense. I've done some of it. <laughs> Tell me about these brand partnerships. What is what is that for you? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And it is great to see you again too, Mark. Um, you know, as a keynote speaker, uh, here's Dustin.com is my platform that I'm all able to partner with different corporate brands and not only share my story but also help shine light on the efforts they're doing related to diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, belonging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my story as somebody who is profoundly deaf and has worn hearing aids since I was five is a vessel to the overall message. The message is the key to success in life is communication. And the key to communication is access. And so, it's my passion to stand up in front of hundreds of people and and share my story and learn about this. So tell me a little bit about like when you go to one of your brand partners, right? When you go to one of these companies and you start to share your story and you start to talk to them about communication and access, which is always an interesting thing, right? Because I think people think they think they understand access until they hear a story like yours and then they realize maybe it's a little bit more complicated than what they had originally thought what's what's the reaction how does how, how do people react to that and how how does it end up improving things for them in that corporate environment just like life accessibility is a journey right and everybody has a unique story so whether they're hearing my story for the first time or your story or anybody else's story they realize oh wow i hadn't thought about that you know, we're creating this new product or a new program. I hadn't thought of that, about that approach, right? So it makes people realize that accessibility is a journey with no finish line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's so motivating to all of us to learn and utilize different stories, you know, experiences in my life from when I was a little kid to when I was 11 years old and went to Michael Jordan basketball camp, for example, and we can get into that later, but that's where I created my motto, be on offense at mm -hmm. 11 years old. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit, but you know, whether it was high school or my college experience, my professional career, you know, that life, those stories, that experience is a journey and we can learn so much from each. So, so talk to me a little bit about what your story is. I mean, I think we get the basics, right? Like, obviously, um, you're deaf. It sounds like that was something that was progressive that started when you were a child. Um, tell me, Dustin, like, what, what's, what's the story? What did you go through? And what did you learn going through? It sounds like you had some challenges and you had some adventures. Like, what are the things that you you learned along the way? Even before I was diagnosed with a profound hearing loss, um, I was uh, introduced to disability and handicap at a very young age. My mm -hmm. grandfather was a double amputee. And so he had prosthetics. He had a, a wooden hook and uh, a wooden leg. He got in a boating accident in his mid-20s and helping somebody. He was the one that hit the propeller and Oof. he survived it. Uh, he survived it and, and thrived. And, you know, he was always upbeat, positive. You know, he taught me PMA, positive mental attitude and what that meant. 
uh, never to take no for an answer. And so I was already introduced, right, at a very young age. And at the age of five, uh, see, one year I passed the school nurse's hearing exam. Who remembers that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I passed it, no problem. But then the second year, I remember standing in line and they had put a board up in between the, the nurse and all the students. And I remember looking at the board and watching the students realizing for the first time, this isn't going to work for me. Hmm. I read lips. Right. And I watched them. I remember watching them click the button to make the beeps go off. Like yep. raise your hand when you hear the beeps. Yep. I remember seeing their arm move. And I was just adapting. I just did what I had to do to succeed, get an A on that test. So you were you were faking your way based on observation, basically, through the hearing test. Nobody in my family was deaf, so I didn't even know what it meant to be deaf. I just did what I had to do to succeed. You just figured out just figured out what was going on and, and handle it a different way. I learned way. how to watch the mouth move and mm. and how words were so formulated. You were reading lips and thought that that's what everybody did, essentially. Yeah. Like you didn't realize that there was that everybody else was hearing a, a voice that you weren't hearing or at least not hearing as well. That is fascinating. That's fascinating. So what? Uh, so when when did it? When did you figure all that out? When when did it dawn on you? Hey, wait a minute, something's going on differently with with me than my peers and my family. They immediately called my mom and said, "I think you, your son is deaf." And my mom said, mm -hmm. "What?" You know, pun intended, and and no one in my family realized it because at a young age, that was, you know, I, I read everybody's lips. I put myself in a position that I could hear them. Mm -hmm. And and how old, are you, how old are you at this point? I'm 30. Well, I'm 34 no, now. Back then, but at that, back then, then I, was, I was five years old. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so very, very young age. And I had one older brother and... Uh, you know, not a not a huge family, but one older brother. I knew a bunch of his friends. I just fit in, you know, played basketball my whole life. And yeah, it was never something that held me back. It's also a testament to just how clever kids are, right? Seriously. Like, like you can't you can't take anything for granted because a five year old's gonna figure stuff out that you wouldn't imagine a five year old's gonna figure out. And I'm, and I'll tell you before you go on that we were talking before the mics heated up, right? And we we started um, the podcast here um, because I was asking you, you know, kind of how you how you communicate, and and I brought up sign language, which you said you knew a little bit of. Well, I had a a friend, so I used to publish a magazine, and um, one of my clients that I would walk into every day, their daughter worked in this bookstore, hmm. and. Um, I chatted with her and she had a voice about like yours. It was, it was good, but it wasn't, you know, it, 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 it sounded like there was a little something different about it. We'll just say, but, but just a little bit, you know, not, not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so I thought, well, whatever, you know, there's this a speech thing or I didn't really think much about it. And I uh, dealt with her for quite a while only to find out later on like you, that she was deaf and, mm -hmm. This was before cochlear implants. She um, really didn't have hearing aids that she could use at all. She was mm. deaf, but she grew up in, in um, you know, her parents, like many parents not knowing what to do, um, had put her through schooling to teach her how to read lips and to teach her how to speak. So she went through intense speech therapy. That's why her, her voice was so good. Um, but it was amazing to me, to your point, to realize that she was deaf and that this whole time she had been reading lips. And I think what happened is that um, she had turned around and I had said some stuff to her. And when she turned back around, you know, we both, she realized I was speaking and I realized she didn't understand. And that's how I found out. But at that time she was learning sign language. So, so just Dustin, that's when I, when I learned sign languages, I, I started mm -hmm. I'm really good friends with her and um, met the whole deaf community in our um uh, area and learn sign language but um very very similar story like you know she was deaf from birth 
but took a while for parents to realize it. And these hearing parents didn't, mm. they didn't have a manual. You know what I mean? They yeah. didn't know what to do, which put right. her in a, in a, uh, an odd predicament where she sort of was, had one foot in hearing culture and one foot in deaf culture, which is another whole, whole story. Um, but I guess that's my, my question for you is that once your parents realized that you were deaf, how did they, like, how did they handle it? How did they react to it? And, and, well, just tell me that. To, to yeah, I mean, start with. we immediately went to Boston Children's Hospital, the uh, mm-hmm. Waltham location, and got a you know proper hearing exam mm-hmm. in the fo- in the booth and everything. And sure enough, I was severely deaf at the time, severe, se- severe, profound. And over the next few years, it gradually decreased to the profound levels, and you know that's the most significant loss. And so. Mm-hmm. When we looked back, our doctor at the time and my mom came to an agreement that it was from chickenpox. Now, chickenpox is a virus, right? And I had a very severe case of chickenpox all on my face and my ears as a young, young boy. And it must have damaged my cochlea, which are hair cells Mm -hmm. that vibrate when you hear sound. Mine were broken. So they might be not moving the way yours or others with quote normal hearing uh move and so it was a gradual decrease from about the age five to 12 and finally i remember just i mean you got to remember this is constant visits to the audiologist Mm -hmm. every few weeks month my mom's driving me back and forth it was kind of a pain right but i always you know kept my grandfather's voice in my head pma dusty you got to do what you got to do mm-hmm. you know that's life and um you know I, I did what i had to do but i finally said to myself i don't want to lose my hearing anymore <laughs> of course and from that point on you know that attitude that be on offense mentality so let me talk about that for a second yeah right? go for it i was 11 years old my brother was 14 my parents surprised us with tickets to Michael Jordan's basketball camp in Chicago. This was a week long camp in Chicago with campers from all over the world. There was a wait list. My, my late father's aunt worked at the college and was able to get us on the wait list years prior. And we finally got called. And um, so we got to meet Michael Jordan every day, one way or another. And one night he was given an auditorium speech. It was mid middle of the week. And uh, they actually just announced the all-star teams. And I made the all-star team for my age group. Wow. So I'm sitting with my new teammates from all over the world. And um, we're waiting for Michael Jordan to come out. I was about 50, 60 feet away from the stage off on the left side. And as soon as he came out and started talking, everybody started laughing. And I very quickly realized I couldn't hear anything he said. Mm. And being five, six years new into being deaf, in that moment, Mark, it was up to me to get the help I needed. There was a counselor walking up and down the aisle. All I had to do was ask, hey, you know, I'm deaf. I read lips. May I sit up front? But I pretended to laugh and pretended to smile for the full hour. Oh. I was embarrassed, right? My new teammates, I didn't want that moment to be a barrier, especially having just made the all-star team. And and that's what Here's Dustin is all about. That's what my brand, what I am all about today is I don't want any other 11-year-old or kids or parents, adults, to pretend to laugh or pretend to smile. There's so much help out there. You know, companies like TPGI, Vispero, 3 Play Media, you name it. There's so many companies out there with resources that help Mm -hmm. all people with disabilities and abilities. So so that sort of one moment that you look back on and regrets, probably not the right word, but wish you at that age could have handled differently 
that really is the inspiration for everything that you do today, everything that you're talking about today. What you you bring up a good point when you talk about that story. I mean, we're all humans, right? And we all are social creatures. So I think, you know, it's it's really profound and understandable that what held you back is that you didn't want to be embarrassed in front of your peers. How, when, when you were diagnosed and when, and I guess probably more when it was more obvious to the people around you that you were deaf, how did your peers, how did that affect things with your peers? How did they react to that? And how did you handle it? I mean, I already had a great group of friends, you know, and, mm -hmm. and support within my family. Um, so when I got hearing aids, I already had glasses and I saw them as just something that helps me hear, just like glasses help right. me see. And that's what I told my friends, you know, and, you know, all through elementary school, people knew my older brother already. So then they knew me and the teachers acted like it was no big deal. And so I acted like it was no big deal. And then my that's peers great. acted like it was no big deal. And I did great in academics and I did even better on the basketball court. And that's fantastic. I let my actions speak for themselves. And, you know, I was just recently talking to another client about how when when I was at recess, all I wanted to do was play basketball. And that's what we did, right? And different games and kickball and you name it. And I was the best one on the court. I picked the players that got picked last because I knew what the feeling of inclusion felt like mm -hmm. as somebody who has a disability i know what feeling included and excluded feels like sure yeah so having picked the quote worst player on the team first made me work even harder mm. and smarter right and so you know i just found it so fun to see us all win no matter what the scoreboard said. Wow, what a great attitude. Well, I think you're, you know, you're really, you were really lucky to have a supportive group of friends and a supportive family, right? That probably, in in your, um, super lucky to have a grandfather with uh, yeah. the experience he had that had the attitude that he had, and that probably really helped set you up for success. So what, when you go out and talk to these organizations and you tell them that story, what's the reaction? Like, what do people come up and sort of tug you on the shirt sleeve and, and, and say to you? Well, you know, it's, it's a fun story to tell. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, you're, you're in enthusiastic and in, in hearing about it. Right. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of ahs and oohs and wows from the crowd. And whether there's, you know, 50 people in front of me or 500, the story allows for this relationship to happen in that moment. I make eye contact with everybody because I have to read lips, but mm -hmm. I have to read facial expressions. One engagement I did with a very large corporation outside of Boston, uh, I noticed in this moment, I was, I was uh, building up the story to make a point and as soon as I was about to make the point, I could see a woman behind another woman trying to look around her head, which mm -hmm. was kind of blocking her view to me. Mm -hmm. I noticed that. And when I made the point, I stepped forward so she could see me. And that moment was an accessibility moment. I wanted right. her to see me just as the same way I have to see her. And I said right after that, did anybody notice that I stepped forward when I made that point. No one really raised their hand mm -hmm. and I wasn't expecting them to because that's just how I talk. I said only one person might have noticed. And she kind of thought it was her, but wasn't sure. And I said, was it you? Were you having a hard time seeing me? Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. I want you guys to see me just as much as I need to see you. So in conversations at work, Let's remember, open up our shoulders to have a circle, right? Your yep. ERG employee resource group is called the circle, the disability circle. Mm -hmm. So let's open up, right? And so that's the action step 
that I encourage us all and, and uh, just bring awareness to. It's interesting that you say that I've, you know, through my life, I've uh, attended a lot of um, like social functions for work and, you know, th those areas where you have to meet a lot of new people. And one of the things that I've always done is exactly like you said, these circles form and just having that awareness when other people are walking up or want, when other people want to join the circle that you've got to open that circle a little bit and bring that person in, you know, don't let some, I, I don't want to have somebody have to like look over my shoulder. It's right. always, it's always mm -hmm. moving out. And I think that, you know, just as an overall analogy, that's kind of what you're talking about with communication is like open up that circle and let's keep it a circle because when it's a circle, we're all equal in our ability to see and engage with each other. But as soon as somebody's behind or, or something like that, it's, it's, it's not that. Yeah. You know? And not only that, it's, if somebody comes in and you want to welcome them, yes, mm -hmm. open up, but also include them on where you're at in the conversation you're yeah. talking about. Yep. Hey, we're just talking about X, Y, and Z. You yep. want to join us? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. You know, yep. how good that feels to just be so welcomed into a mm -hmm. conversation about anything, Game of Thrones, uh, you know, business talk, different events. Whatever it is. Yeah anything and speaking of game of thrones right you need the closed <laughs> caption for that show right <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i need the closed captions because it's hard enough for me to follow 80 percent of people that use closed captions are not deaf or hard of hearing oh i believe it yeah imagine I mean, just, just situationally just in bars and restaurants and i'm learning a second language i use closed captions to help me learn a second language you yeah, know absolutely and then a lot of people, my son and his girlfriend leave closed captions on almost all the time. Just, I don't know why. For yeah. some reason, don't even need to know why. For some reason, it's a better, a better experience for them. Yeah, that's, and that's a good example of just how, to your point, like making, to accommodating, and maybe you're accommodating for someone who, who has a disability and needs an accommodation, but anytime you make that accommodation available you have no idea the number of people that may be using that accommodation for their own personal reasons or in specific circumstances or or anything like that so what um what have you found like what has helped you just in your career and getting through life what are the things that you've needed uh to make sure in, are in place for yourself um that have helped you helped you accommodate kind of your, I guess, always being on offense, right? Like what, what have you offensively made offensively? That's not the way to say it. What have you made sure is, is uh, in place so that you can, you can do what you need to do. Yeah. You know, it's a, a situational question, right? But there's, there's a lot of different accommodation. Of course, my hearing aids, mm -hmm. um, having Bluetooth is amazing. As I mentioned to you earlier on is I'm connected on Bluetooth so I can hear your voice directly through my hearing aids. I've got mm -hmm. the captions on uh, and I'm able to read your lips. So that's what makes this experience accessible. Now, remember, when the pandemic hit, I was actually working in a different industry. I was working in the commercial architecture and design industry. I was uh, working for Idea Paint, which is a dry race whiteboard paint that turns your whole wall right yeah. into a whiteboard and it's a fun product for kids and your office and you name it well imagine me being in an office a conference room a boardroom i'm trying to read lips on the right side and then somebody talks over there i'm trying to read lips over there and then they crisscross and it's difficult it's fatiguing mm -hmm. but at least i can read what's on the wall right and so that's why i loved idea paint now when the pandemic hit and the office is closed I realized I needed so much help mm -hmm. and my, you know, the deaf community needed help. And so I jumped to learn all about closed captioning and video accessibility with Free Play Media and spent 18 months there, built relationships with, you know, the team and the clients, the partners, and really understood what, you know, Free Play is such a thought leader in the space for yeah. accessibility and, oh, yeah. and DEI. And so, yeah. I looked up to them to be able to realize how important just sharing your story and your motto be on offense. And 
the different accessibility and accommodations that I use, how important that is to everybody, right? There's 50 million Americans affected by hearing loss. Wow. 430 million affected by hearing loss in the world. Now go back to America real quick for, for more numbers and stats. Of those 50 million, 28 million people say, yeah, hearing aids or other assistive technology would absolutely help me. I would benefit from that. Right. However, only 14% of that population, 4.5 million, actually get the help they need. Wow. Is that a financial barrier or is it apathy or all of the above? What do you, what's that attributed to? All the above, whether it's financial confidence. Uh, what about you have a job and what if you disclose that you're deaf mm -hmm. and you're insecure about that? Or once upon a time, you didn't tell people that you were had a, dif a disability or a difference. Now, today, it's about sharing your abilities right because our differences lead to innovation yeah right yep i was just gonna say that i mean i think that that's almost a, a strong second message in your story is that based on what you based on how you had to innovate like that original story right of of uh um, you figuring out how to pass the hearing test, even though you couldn't hear. I mean, that's incredible innovation. It's innovation that I didn't have to do. My mm -hmm. brain's not like somehow your brain is rewired and has a new ability because you had to innovate at that level and, and continue to do that through your life. And what does that bring to an employer? What does that bring to your brand partners? What does that bring to anybody and everybody that you come in contact with, you know, that is a, that's a value. That's a um, ability that you've created that other people don't have. And, and, and I see that because I know that because I have uh, ADD and dyslexia and with my dyslexia, I've very similarly, you know, I, I had to cheat around spelling you know, like I, ha and I was afraid to death of employers finding out how badly, how bad my spelling was. And, you know, thank goodness for Grammarly and, 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 you know, spell check and all those kind of things today, because it really covers that up for me. But I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I had to find ways to hide that just like you were doing when you were mm. five years old. Um, but by the same token, you know, there's things that uh, I know I'm good at because of all that, you know. So I think that that's almost a, a side message is like, why are we focused? Why why would an employer focus on the fact that you're deaf when they should be focused on the fact that you're you have a unique brand of innovation? Right. Because of of of, you know, how you had to go through go through life and innovate. And speaking of focus, right. Uh Part of the uh, IEP meeting that my parents would go to, individualized right. education program meetings in school, right? I know yes. you've gone to them or, yeah. or you've had them. Yep. Um, and, you know, part of the accommodation was a couple of things. Seating arrangements, mm -hmm. sitting up front in front of the teacher, if in front of the lecturer, professor, whoever it may be. I had, I had so that, that one too. <laughs> yeah. And it's so helpful to stay yeah. focused and read lips and facial expressions and really tune in to really understand and build that relationship with whoever it is. The second thing was also uh, in school, I had what's called an FM system. That was a microphone that the teacher would wear that connected to my hearing aids. Oh, brilliant. And so it gave me- it's on the web. Oh, A watch just went off and it was, <laughs> it was researching what an FM system was. My Apple Watch. Nice. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Apple. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you know, there's, there's a lot of different things, and and now I have a Bluetooth microphone that I can bring around in different scenarios where yeah. I, I really want to focus on one speaker and a loud audience or what have you. Put it on mm -hmm. a table in a restaurant or a boardroom, and it can detect 
voices 360 or only wow. in front of you. It's very cool. Um, it's called the Roger Pen, and uh, it's compatible with other uh, brands, hearing aids that have Bluetooth capabilities. That's It's amazing what uh, technology, like how technology has leveled the playing field, you know, for everyone. And that's one of the, you know, one of the things that's important to us is like those technologies are great. And digital tech, as you know, as you know, from your your past employment, right, it's not enough just to have the technology there. We need to make sure that everybody's doing what they need to, you know, doing their part to make sure that technology right. can be on their content, you know. Right. And um, that's a little different with than, than what you're talking about. But um, I just think that the, the world needs to understand that the playing field is now leveled, you know. That- and there's so many people that have helped us get there. Yeah. And so, you know, you think of people, of course, Mike Petrello, uh, uh, Matt Adder from Vispero. You think of so many champions in the space mm-hmm. that just we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the years and years of commitment and dedication. Absolutely. And their understanding of disabilities and abilities and technology and innovation and everything else in between. You know, there was an amazing moment. I was just at CES technology conference in Las Vegas mm-hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, Matt Addo was there. Yep. And we got to connect. And I went to one of his speaking engagements one morning. And yep. then later on, I ended up bumping into him. So how I ended up bumping into him was I was on the main floor of the convention. And when it's, when I'm in a loud environment like that, I usually shut one hearing aid off. Okay. Because I'm able to feel the bass better. And then the volume better on the right side. Okay. So otherwise it's too much noise and I can't really find the bass. Mm -hmm. And so I shut one off, keep one on. And in this moment, it was so loud, but I'm hearing and feeling this bass around the wall. I was almost expecting a performance. And so I follow it and I round the corner and all it was was a few people sitting around a table testing audio equipment and i get closer and it's mad at her <laughs> and I'm like oh matt cool and then i look to his right my left it was stevie wonder oh yeah yeah and so they're fooling around with this high quality audio equipment by svs yeah and my god it was just amazing to witness yeah. stevie wonder and matt just play with this equipment and appreciate sound music Mm -hmm. so much as somebody who's profoundly deaf to witness somebody who's blind, appreciate that moment, that sound, because I appreciate music so much. I play instruments myself and, you know, it it was just an amazing moment and and an awesome experience. Yep. Stevie Wonder and Matt are uh, often moving around together. And, uh, yeah and it's uh yeah it's amazing and that's i think that's a, the that matt would say it about stevie is that that to this day like just his appreciation for that sound you know that is music really is profound like it's not hey this is cool i made a career out of it he absolutely knows and loves just music and sound and all that kind of all that kind of stuff that's a great story great story so did you get to talk to Stevie? So in that moment, I didn't bother him. No one bothered him, right? For you. I ended up bumping into him 30 minutes later. Mm-hmm. Uh, people, fans were all around him uh, when he was on a golf cart. And uh, it, he was going right by me. So I was able to say at the end, uh, Stevie, I'm uh, I'm profoundly deaf. I've worn hearing aid since I was a little boy and haven't watched you listen to the music. That was amazing. Thank you so much for everything you've done in the world. That's all I said. And Great. his smile grew and grew and grew. And he looked at me and said, what's your name? And I said, Dustin Janelli. And he said, thanks, man. Pound it. And that. Yeah. What a great guy. A lot of respect for both Stevie Wonder and Matt Eater. Really do. Good, good people. Are you, are you going to be, so you and I met at CSUN, which both of those people are, uh, uh, often there are you mm-hmm. going to go to csun again this year do you think 
Not confirmed just yet. Um, okay. There's a lot of different travel plans and speaking engagements on my calendar, dating out to July for ADA Day on July 26th. Busy man, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's it's a very cool, um, it's just been an amazing journey. And I'm grateful for everybody that helped me get to where I am today and all the different companies and champions that are bringing me on to speak and share my story and, you know, sky's the limit at this point. Mm. So we need to wrap things up, Dustin, but I'm wondering like, you know, if there's like one message and I know you've said a few of them through the podcast, but just one thing that you would like people to really walk away with, really understand, um, what would that be? Such a profound question, right? It's, you know, how I got to where I am today as a speaker is admiring so many other speakers, right? And this goes back when I heard people like, if you know Eric Qualman, they call him the equal man. Okay. And he has millions and millions of, I mean, he's reached about, 40 million people globally. He has a podcast. He's interviewing The Rock and, you know, Kevin Hart and all sorts of figures, but he's called the equal man. So he has a lot of, you know, great messages about equality and things of that nature. And, you know, people like him, uh, different teachers and professors, they share stories. They, they slow life down. Oh, yeah. The way they talk. And then they speed it up and they hit the point home, right? <laughs> that passion, right? So to answer your question, it's it's share your story because you never know who you're inspiring and everybody has a different story. I might have a similar degree of hearing loss as your friend that you you mentioned earlier, but we have completely different stories and they're really both different. valuable, right? Yeah. And so that's the point is if we can all continue to share our story and what accommodations are out there that help us in different situations, that's what's going to help us as people and us as the American people, for example. Mm -hmm. Go back to that stat. Like there's so many Americans that aren't utilizing or benefiting from things like hearing aids and we need to help them. And that's why... As somebody who has worn them since I was five, I have a obligation, a, a sense of responsibility to encourage them to get what they need. I think that's my big takeaway here is that if you can make that decision to always be on offense, to, 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 to appropriate your phrase and advocate for yourself, what we heard today, the Dustin that, that that we just heard today, that's who you get to be. Whereas if you're not willing to do that for yourself, if you can't find a path to that, it's going to be much, much more difficult. And uh, so I love your, I love your goal of really making sure you get that message, particularly to kids, right? Because that's when it starts. If you can help kids understand at a young age that they need to advocate for themselves and no matter what their situation is, it's okay. It's fine. You just need to advocate for yourself in a way that you can take the best advantage of that situation um, that you can. And you just are living proof and your story is proof of that. Absolutely. And just recently I did a and a uh, experience on Instagram mm -hmm. and my God, I, I mean, I was flooded with questions and curiosity and it was fun. You know, I did it on mm -hmm. a Sunday. So that was a fun way to spend my second half of the day and into Monday. And that opened the eyes and ears of a lot of people. And that's just one platform. I mean, you can find me on Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn, where I do a ton of advocacy and posting weekly um, and my website, here's Dustin.com. So always uh updating and and you know uh, a lot of videos to come and engagements to come perfect and we'll put all that in the show notes so if you're listening to this and you're like where do i find all that just just check out the show notes we'll have that all on the on the uh, website 
along with the transcript and all all that uh we'll we'll make sure this is captioned everything will be uh everything will will accommodate for everyone um thank you so much dustin i really appreciate it um i wish we had more time i hope that uh we run into each other again soon at csun or at some other conference but great catching back up with you it was great talking to you years ago and uh i'm i'm hoping it's not uh too long before we connect again well, I will be at University of New Hampshire, where we both went, right? Um, I will be speaking on the 1st, as well as the 9th, for a Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Conference at the New Business School. Um, so I'll be there. I'll send you the dates, and hopefully, if you're around, you can either join or uh, we can get coffee after. Yeah, that's that's 20 minutes away from me. So Exactly. Please, please do that. Hey, I'm here with Dustin Gianelli. We are at the second annual Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Conference here at UNH. Um, and we've seen a lot of great speakers. You were one of the great speakers. Um, and I got to tell you, uh, my friend Dustin here called me out in the middle of his speech to talk to the group. Invited um, him. Invited, invited him. That was the word I was looking for. Um, but how's the conference been for you so it's far? Great. You know, it's, it's all about bridging, uh, building bridges and, uh, you know, talking about the importance of inclusion and invisible, there's visible disabilities mm -hmm. and all the above and all everything in between. So it's been very valuable, a lot of diversity here. And uh, this is the second annual, so I'm already looking forward to the thing. I'm looking forward to the third. Well, I appreciate you being on that podcast last week, and it was great seeing you again here. And this is all great work. And uh, keep speaking. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Mark. This is Mark Miller thanking Dustin and reminding you to keep it accessible. This podcast has been brought to you by TPGI, the experts in digital accessibility. Stay tuned for more Real People, Real Stories podcasts coming soon.